Good morning and welcome to day two of our fifth streaming media connect. I know we're all champing at the bit to get back to in-person gatherings, but these streaming media connect events have been a great way to keep the conversations going in our industry while we haven't been able to meet in person. And if you're wondering about meeting in person, Streaming Media West is all systems go at this point. Uh, we're planning it for the first week of November in Huntington Beach, California. And Steve Nathans Kelly, our producer, and in this session, our moderator will paste the link to Streaming Media Connect in the chat. The program is live and we'll be adding speakers over the next week or two. The chat will be open during this Zoom panel, but we do ask that if you have questions for our panelists, you put them in the Q&A tab. That makes it easier for us to keep track of them and get them to the panelists. Uh, we'll save most of the questions for the end, and Steve, our moderator, will pose them to the panelists. Also, another technical note, uh, live captioning is turned on. If you want to turn it off, go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, click on live transcript, and I believe the uh, the text there is hide transcript. Um, so that's how to do that. Uh, last housekeeping note, we are giving away a $50 Amazon gift card at every one of our Streaming Media Connect sessions. Stick around to the end, though. You must be present to win, and we will announce the winner of that Amazon gift card at the end of this and every panel. I'd like to thank our diamond sponsor for Streaming Media Connect, Limelight Networks, is helping us bring this week of panels and presentations to you, and we thank them for their support. We also thank Blackbird for supporting and sponsoring this particular session, and Daniel Webster from Blackbird will be joining this all-star panel as they discuss how to simplify complex remote productions. I think that wraps up the housekeeping notes, so with that, I will pass the mic over to our producer and this time, our moderator, Steve Nathans Kelly. Steve, good morning. Morning, Eric. Um, so, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to see. You. It's great to actually uh, be on camera and on mic for this one, along with my uh, co-pilot. Uh, Point the wrong way here, Sheldon. Um, so, welcome everyone. It's good to uh, get started. So, you know, so so as Eric said, the topic of this uh, session is simplifying complex remote productions. And, you know, the, the global pandemic the last year and a half has really placed most of us squarely in the era of remote production. And a lot of times left us in triage mode when it comes to production, um, whether you pivoted out of necessity or were incorporating Remy and cloud workflows before the pandemic demanded it. You know, it's quite likely that your approach has gone through several different iterations over the last year and that it'll continue to evolve, not just as a pandemic persists, but as these new workflows continue to bring more agility and more efficiency to the way we work. Um, one of the questions we'll explore on the panel today is when we get to this new normal that we all love to talk about and hope to get to, um, will decentralized production continue to play a central role? Um, so let's start with intro. So we got a great panel representing a range of approaches and people who came to remote production at different times and for different reasons. Um, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves since they can do that better than I can. Um, so, and, and I'll have them just tell us real briefly about who they are, their companies and the kind of work they do. Um, let's start with uh, Anna from LiveX. Hi everyone, thanks for having me today. Um, yes, I'm from LiveX. We have uh, master control rooms in New York and Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, we've been doing field production for a very long time and we have a studio in New York. Um, and we were doing remotes probably starting 2019, 2018. Um, and then of course, you know, overnight, like so many others, we switched to, you know, 90% remote, you know. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, and uh, just going uh, alphabetically by first name, let's go to uh, Manhattan-based director and TD, Ben Ratner. Where'd you go, Ben? Uh, am I there now? There I am. Uh, I'm the least prepared technically for this panel. I'm using my phone because my studio is being used that has all the good Zooms up. Uh, I am Ben. Uh, I work for a company called Maven where we do production for both Sports Illustrated and The Street with Jim Cramer. Um, we were, you know, uh, as far as remote stuff goes, we were planning on sending a bunch of remote stuff to people prior to COVID hitting. 
Uh, so we were a little bit on the ground when it started, but it really kickstarted us uh, when the world came to a sudden and rapid halt. Okay, and uh, over to uh, Daniel Webster, Blackbird. Daniel, you there? I am here. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so I work for Blackbird, as you just heard, uh, cloud video uh, platform. And uh, basically, we've seen an immense sort of uptick in business because of the pandemic. Um, basically, Blackbird allows you to edit from anywhere and distribute content to everywhere. Uh, my background is uh, 20 years in uh, television at CBS, Fox, and whatever, and then started in this streaming video space back in 2000. Seems like a long time ago, but um, uh, COVID has definitely sort of accelerated the pace of the adoption um, of um, cloud video technologies, not least editing, and uh, happy to be with an esteemed group of people on this panel. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. And uh, let's see, next up, uh, Jeff Keithley of Live Sports LLC and Pizzazz. Now, we never know where Jeff is going to be when he calls in for one of these events. Um, so first off, Jeff, just tell us where you are today. Well, I'm actually, uh, I'm sort of close to our work site. We're actually in Winston-Salem producing some professional tennis for the Winston-Salem Open uh, with my live sports company. Uh, Pizzazz is my system integration company, and we do cloud implementations and build out cloud workflows for clients as a consultancy and also as a system as a service. Uh, live sports has actually been, we've been pioneering on the remote side for quite a while. Uh, I've been four or five, almost five years now that we've been using remote robot cameras and uh, not just PTCs, but actually robotics and using workflows that allow our employees and, and our freelancers, everyone that works with us to be able to work from anywhere. So we've been doing distributed workflow well before we had to with COVID. And uh, it has been, it's been great being able to say, okay, well, we've got this, we've, we've done this. Let's just slowly adapt to that as sports are getting to come back now we're starting to get busier and and it's it's it, all the technology that moves so fast in the last year is just making things that much better for us now it's not near the fight thanks jeff and uh last but certainly not least uh, another producer i met last year actually when i interviewed him remotely about the pivot to remote production uh marty jenoff focal point productions Hi, everybody. So I'm Marty uh, from Focal Point, based in Baltimore, Maryland. I have uh, 30 years of video experience. I actually used the money from my bar mitzvah to buy my first RCA VHS camcorder, which I still have. Uh, so you know, a lot's changed in the last 30 years. Uh, Focal Point was started in 2000, doing mostly uh, corporate videos. In 2010, we started doing live streaming. Before COVID, I'd say that live streaming was about 20% of our business. But now since COVID, I'd say that live streaming is 90% of what we do now. Uh, the, the Baltimore area has seen a, a huge increase in doing live streaming and hybrid events, as well as doing a lot of completely remote and, um, and just complete live streaming events from all, all over the world. So um, yeah, the, the, our background is mostly in video production, but it's uh, you know, morphed into live streaming over the last probably five or six years. Thanks, Marty. And and you're, you're a little bit quiet. If you could, if there's any way you could just uh, bring the volume a little bit. Um, great. Well, let's let's get started. Let's just sort of jump right into this. Um, so let's you know kind of start with kind of something a little little open ended, uh, close to the topic at hand. Um, so when you when you you know made the uh, when you first started making the pivot to remote production, um, what were the biggest challenges that you encountered and what are the biggest, you know, how has that changed with the challenges that you're dealing with uh, today? And let's, let's start with Ben. On that. Yeah, I'd say the biggest challenge was not so much the people who do the tech stuff, because a lot of us already knew how to use, you know, a lot of the software, hardware that already is natively designed to work remotely, but it's the people who don't do this every day. Uh, mostly the talent, specifically talent and guests. Uh, getting them to have the ability to, you know, set up a camera for the first time, lights, having their shot look good, not, you know, just the basic things, even upgrading their internet, that's just been a consistent challenge, particularly in early COVID. Um, a lot of that is getting easier because people, you know, there came a point probably seven, eight months into the pandemic where people started showing up with their own ring lights. 
Um, and that was great because it meant that people were, you know, doing a lot of the hard, annoying work for us. Um, but biggest challenges today are probably um, a lot of the people I work with now, they still have all these remote guests. People want to work from home, but they still want higher quality stuff. So it's figuring out the kinds of equipment and the kinds of workflows that they're able to manage remotely where we can't send an engineer to help uh, set up and maintain it constantly. All right, anyone want to jump in there next? Yeah, I would say our experience has been pretty similar. A lot of what we were doing early on was client education, right? Like explaining to them what options are available, right? Like there's so many different ways you can be remote, but how do you do it safely? And how do you make sure your talent is really comfortable while it's happening? Um, so it was so much client education and like, there was, I think, so much anxiety happening at the time too. People's businesses were under threat and their livelihoods were under threat. And so really being there and explaining to them that everything's going to be okay, you could totally do this, and, and creating an infrastructure that made clients and producers, non-technical producers, feel really comfortable and cared for and at home that they were still in control. Right. So developing our communications channels and things like that, I think, made a big difference. And now it, it really is about, well, how do you not do the same show over and over again? How do we break some of the molds? How do we innovate and make your content look distinctive, but keep your talent really comfortable? Right. Because talent hasn't changed. So, so I'll, I'll pick up on that. And it's not just about educating. It's also about sort of convincing and you know, COVID has sort of forced everybody to sort of rethink the way that they do things. And, uh, you know, much of our sort of business has been sort of downstream of what a lot of people on this call do is basically picking up those live signals and being able to provide sort of uh, remote uh, editing and just simply convincing people who are sort of stuck in their ways with traditional on-prem sort of workflows uh, to try something new uh, has been, and to show them and to show how powerful that can be, has been the sort of major sort of focus uh, for us. The good news is, is that you can do uh, practically everything remote now. There are some sort of outliers, but you'd be surprised how much you can do uh, now in a remote sort of situation. I would agree with Daniel completely on that too, as far as not just remote, but now as we move more and more workflows to the cloud, that has opened up a, a very large chasm of possibility because now it, we're not locked into either a data center. We're not locked into just that on-premise uh, resources that are there. We can do everything that we can do on the ground or in a MCR or in a truck, we can now do in the cloud. And that that's amazing. And, and now getting people to understand that is the next step for us in our remote uh, workflows, that's for sure. Marty, anything to add there? Well, first let me ask, how do I, do I sound better? Is the volume uh, better? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, great. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, no, so I really agree with, the, with what everybody said. Um, you know, some of the challenges that we encountered were more, I guess, on our remote presenters, you know, making sure that they just had the basics. Um, you know, a good camera, good light, good internet. We were doing shows like on, um, you know, at least in the Baltimore area, a lot of the school systems uh, were all hybrid. So we found that on some of those days, you know, if the presenter was at home and their kids are online doing classwork, their internet wasn't good. So we were getting a lot of dropouts. So it was just uh, keeping that in mind where it's not just, you know, it's not like it used to be back in the day. There's a lot of other um, constraints on the infrastructure and the network in individuals' homes and in their workplaces. So we may have to do things at odd hours or maybe ask them to get their kids to go to a friend's house or something like that so that, um, you know, that they would have a good internet when doing, when doing sessions. Great. So, um, and so, so, you know, I, let's talk a little bit more about specific workflows and kind of how they've, how they've evolved. Um, so, you know, are, are there particular kind of innovations or changes actually in your approach that you can point to as you've sort of streamlined your, your remote workflows over the last year or so? Um, Anna, let's, let's start with you. Yeah, I'm, 
for us, we kind of, you know, after the first couple weeks of doing it, we sort of took stock of the tools that existed and said, you know, how can we do this even better, right? So that we're not living, so that Zoom isn't the only option, that VMix Call isn't the only option. Um, and because of that, we started developing tools. We looked at the things that High Vision was offering um, on mobile apps for SRT streaming um, and developed our own SRT streaming that was more talent friendly, right? So that all they have to do is type in six digits uh, into the Rivet app and we can bring that feed into our control room, right? And then seeing how powerful that was, we developed cloud routing with virtual video control room that we developed uh, for the DNC and other partners, being able to do cloud routing, right? Um, moving feeds across the country got a lot easier as we were developing tools and identifying this is what we want so let's go build it and we think other people will like it too um, and that's kind of been a big change in our approach is our use of srt technologies and our willingness to kind of build whatever it is that we want i'll just pick up on what um anna was sort of saying along those lines and as all the people on this call are sort of solving the problem of acquisition via SRT, Zixi, um, or RIST or whatever, uh, getting it into the cloud, once it's there, uh, you really have a myriad of sort of advantages uh, because you're not having to move giant files around and you can essentially uh, manage everything in a much more sort of centralized sort of manner from multiple sort of um, disparate sort of points. And that allows you not only a lot of sort of production uh, capabilities, but a lot of advantages in terms of productivity and uh, cost savings. Uh, and I would sort of maintain, you know, I'm a former news guy, so I, I, I think that it's safe to say that 95% of, of news and sports can be done in a cloud environment without um, any sort of uh, hesitation. There are some sort of edge cases as I've sort of referenced early, but the vast majority of stuff, once you bring it into the cloud, can be pretty much managed uh, very effectively, uh, both in terms of uh, ingest, production, and distribution uh, workflow. And I'd say for us, you know, last year, um, most of what we did was all, all virtual. Um, I'd say around March, April, when things started to, um, when requirements started to, to loosen up a little bit, we started going more to in-person and hybrid events. So we really had to change because last year we were all just here in our control room doing things. So some of the evolutions that we've had to take is just kind of doing more on location events and you know investing more in cameras and, um, and lighting and audio gear for doing some more uh, to help clients take some of those events uh, from all virtual to now into the hybrid world. Yeah, I'd say one of the big uh, approach changes in what uh, we do and the kind of production that I do is understanding that the audience might have different expectations. They might not know how much work or care how much work they just want to see an end product and they might not care that it's the absolute shiniest thing on earth. Obviously, we want good production quality, but they may not know the difference between, you know, something that's 100% or 95%. Um, so for me, it's the switch to things like um, uh, StreamYard, things like Riverside FM, the ability to do production in ways that don't use a lot of traditional equipment, um, but are just very easy, very cheap. Um, it's, it's increased our ability to do production without, you know, the staff that we would have needed to re-ramp up to do a lot more work. I could echo a lot of what everybody said and, and just take a little step that one of our favorite tools that, that came out of all this is uh, the Sienna processing engine in NDI in our cloud infrastructure. Uh, that allows us to do so much more, uh, the routing, the capabilities, uh, and it is, it's been game changing for us to be able to be able to set up multiple control rooms in the cloud and control multiple events at one time. And when the client comes to us and we're doing this big thing for a motivational speaker and we've got 50 different Zoom rooms set up for them, 50 different Zoom meetings set up for them, and they come to us goes, hey, is there any way you can add 25 more? the day of and that is just the part of the cloud that's when it clicks and you're like give me a couple hours no problem and that is a beautiful thing to be able to say to your clients so that's one of the bigger changes for us for sure the flexibility 
So, you know, so far we mostly, <clears throat> excuse me, we've been talking about uh, about live production and live delivery. Um, you know, of course, live delivery isn't always the goal or, or the best option. Um, you know, post is a huge part of this work for, for most of us, um, and post is evolving along with everything else. Um, you know, editing has historically been a highly specialized job. Um, you know, as, as production workflows get simplified and workflows across the board become more collaborative, um, do you see more people needing and being required uh, for editing? Um, Daniel, you want to uh, take this one to start? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I guess um, if anybody sort of recently saw uh, Frame.io just got acquired by Adobe, which sort of speaks <laughs> specifically to that, uh, you know, the, the, w w the reality is, is that we are um, uh, both sort of centralizing and also dispersing, you know, workflows at the same time. Uh, and the ability for everybody to sort of collaborate uh, on uh, workflows is extremely sort of uh, important. Uh, you know, when it comes to editing, uh, I, it's also about adoption. So, um, and it's about sort of changing those sort of uh, conventional sort of ways of doing things. Uh, one of our clients, um, Bloomberg sort of took us on because um, they wanted their journalists uh, to be able to sort of edit practically as easily as they could write a story. Uh, so they have 2,700 journalists and it's, you know, basically the future is about, okay, how do you generate more? How do you generate better content uh, at the end of the day? It doesn't matter, you know, what vertical you're talking about. You know, as we all know, video is um, a very sort of powerful medium and, you know, providing the um, ability to have collaborative access to tools in a cloud environment via a web browser uh, for anybody to uh, have access to and to make it sort of simple for them is the future. And, you know, obviously I feel very passionate about it. It's an overused sort of term. Uh, but, you know, we really do have some democratization of uh, the production uh, tools going on, and it's possible for pretty much any company, any individual for that matter, uh, to uh, start doing things and creating content in a much more uh, compelling and powerful way. Kind of on yeah. that note, I am absolutely obsessed with Riverside FM. I am a live streaming person, like live streaming is my core. Everything I do has always been live streaming, but we realize that not a lot of our production has to be live streamed or done live to tape um, because it's just not timely. Um, and the ability to let produce, uh, if you don't know what Riverside is, it lets you basically do local recordings on other people's computers and then it progressively uploads those video files. Um, so it gives you the best possible quality without a whole bunch of extra equipment, um, video and audio that you can then edit later. But our producers are just able to pop in, press a button, start recording and be done with it. Um, and you, you don't need necessarily the same, you know, high, highly paid senior director to be in there in the control room to cut a couple of cameras around if they can just do it on their own. You know, one change we've noticed this year is with so much more online content, right? There's much more being made because people are sitting around consuming, um, is that it has to be, for your content to stand out, it has to be accessible to all people. Um, and so that's in the form of trimming, right? We say you've got to stream to all the platforms, but you also have to post clips afterwards, right? We use Blackbird for that. We trim and we post so that it's easily digestible to other people. And then the other thing we do is we do a lot of accessibility features like close, live closed captions and ASL translation, language translation, but um, trimming and posting and having a more comprehensive, getting your content online faster in more digestible ways um, is a big change that we've seen. Yeah, Re reversioning is a big workflow. And as you have a sort of multi-platform distribution, so we just did a deal with Univision, uh, also with uh, CBS for a lot of the sports rights that they have. It's about getting it to Paramount Plus and uh, repurposing and localizing it uh, for that. And that's where you sort of need uh, the combination of both sort of live, but also file uh, and the ability to very quickly sort of repurpose it for uh, distribution to multiple different sort of uh, new points. It could be social, could be 
you know, other OTT uh, direct to consumer platforms, multiple places. You've just got to get it to where the people are now. Anyone else want to <clears throat> jump in on that one? Well, I could say that for us in our business, uh, it's live sports, not edited sports. So I try not to touch any editing at all. So for all you people out there, bless you. Thank you for being that person. All right. Well, you know, cir circling back to uh, live, just, you know, to make Jeff happy. Um, well, uh, you know, Let's just talk about some of the specific technologies that are that are critical to sort of meeting the unique challenges of, of remote workflows. You know, comms talk about, you know, these are a big part of any production and they're obviously more complicated when we're in different places. Um, so, you know, how are you handling comms? What's what's working? What is it? Um, and Jeff, let's let's start with you. Sure. Um, comms, we kind of approach on a per project basis. Uh, we have been using VCOM, uh, which is by Intercom Systems for years, uh, over 10 years, actually. Uh, they're, they're kind of a, a, a more advanced system. Uh, it, it is a, it's more like a, a traditional comms matrix. And so it ties in with a, an RTS frame or a higher end ClearCom Eclipse frame or, or the newer um, multi matrix type of multi input output type of frames. Uh, Unity, we've definitely used also, have been using them for years too, but for simpler shows, whenever we just need one or two PLs, three PLs, you know, six PLs, uh, party lines to, to work with, we found that Unity was somewhat easier for some people to get into, uh, but VCOM is just more flexible for us. And especially whenever, as it always comes up, and I, I'm sure everybody here that does live events knows at some point, somebody's going to ask you, well, can I get program audio in my ear? And unless you have your production with Unity server on site for us, we're moving all over the, the country, all over the world, you have to have that server there or you have to do a lot of just other things to make that product, that program audio come back into your system, where with VCOM, it's just a little piece of software you load on a, a local system, pump Dante into it, or now even NDI audio, and it's just there. Uh, we've used Agent IC for those that have that investment in ClearCom already, and it's worked very well also. Some events, whenever we came into them, they, they're, the virtual meeting events, they were using things like Discord and Mumble. So the gaming audio side, that, that didn't, they didn't quite understand. They're like, oh, hey, this is free. We'll just use that. Uh, but then they see the limitations once you have a bunch of people talking on top of each other or, or you don't have that capability of injecting program audio or having multiple PLs that are easily accessible and monitorable. Um, that, that, that is definitely the things we look for is that flexibility. And I just I keep coming back to VCOM for our solutions. So we do use Unity a lot for a lot of our shows. Um, you know, having the multiple channels and being able to get all the users in is pretty quickly and easily has been great. So we use Unity, we'll also use WhatsApp if we want to get um, like a text chat going between um, the producers and then maybe one with the client also, if maybe have two different WhatsApp groups. Uh, we'll also do a, a back-end Zoom meeting where, you know, it's not for broadcast, not for the audience, but we'll have a back-end Zoom meeting for, again, the producers, the client to be able to see in real time what's happening and we can all chat, um, uh, you know, on a, on a back-end through our control room. So we're all on the same page because, as you said, you know, communication is very important. So between us, it's, it's Zoom, Unity, and WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, we have a comms matrix in New York, and that's been, you know, clutch. And we use Agent IC, which you know ties into that really nicely. We'll use Unity because it'll run in tandem with Rivet on a laptop, which has been nice for talent talkback, uh, low latency, um, and then. Uh, now that we're moving to hybrid events where you've got, you know, a rack on site, we'll bring in like an LQ system that we can tie our free speak into. So it's like we're all in one control room, even though we're decentralized in two different spaces or three different spaces. Yeah, we um, sometimes you can't always trust the Internet. So we like to use Dixie brand paper cups with extremely long pieces of string. Uh, and we find that no matter what happens, that'll always be a solid backup. 
you kid about that. I'm literally here. <laughs> we, we did something like that here. Uh, the, the, the two people that needed the comms were literally sitting next to each other. And I'm like, can't they just talk to each other? They're right there. They're literally within five feet of each other. It's like, oh, no, no, we have to have their own PL channel. I'm like, okay, we'll make it happen. And we had to do that for three different places, three different production courts. But yeah, I was like, one of my guys was like, I've got two cups and a string. We're about to set it up. And did get. I was trying to derail the conversation and it actually turned into something. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> So, so what's, you know, just, just opening it up a little more broadly, you know, what's, what's another piece of, you know, kind of key piece of tech that you've found indispensable for your remote production workflows? Um, you know, something that, that kind of holds it all together, and drives the approach you're taking now. Um, Anna, let's, let's start with you. Yeah. I mean, in production, there's no absolutes. Um, you know, something we include and we use in some way on every production is virtual video control room, which of course, you know, it's our tool. So we want to use it, but we found that no matter what, you want to do some kind of remote monitoring, right? You want to give your client a multi-view, be that in Zoom or be it through virtual video control room. Um, you know, those are the big, big things. Uh, comms, you know, uh, there's no one tool that we live and die by unless you want to call it, you know, say vMix, but we do shows without <laughs> vMix as well, you know. Uh, for me, it's bonded cellular. Uh, I don't trust any piece of technology more than in, any of the bonded cellular providers, LiveView, Teradek. Um, I, when I was joking about not always trusting internet connection um, for, you know, vital broadcast you ain't going to be bonded cellular unless you have a satellite truck. And you know what? Good for you and your budget if you do. I would agree also with Ben. Bonded cellular has been huge for us. Uh, Live view has just been uh, indispensable, uh, especially as they were moved into their new LU800 and the four channels. It's just an amazing piece of kit to be able to produce and drop down one box and know that you've got a connection. So definitely bonded cellular. And yeah. I, I guess I'll jump, I'll jump on the bandwagon and, and say the same thing. Uh, we have a tarot that go that we use when we do, um, that we bring as an insurance, I call it an insurance policy. You know, even though for guaranteed internet, when we go on location somewhere, um, I still bring it um, just in case we need it. And there have been a couple of times, probably more than a couple of times, uh, where it's saved our, our ass, where we were promised internet by IT and they're there and, oh, I don't know, you know, uh, they, we can't get online or whatever. So having bonded cellular for live streaming when on location for these kinds of jobs that we're doing, um, is, is invaluable. Yeah. They're, they're a great partner for us as well. Live view is phenomenal. We did a whole bunch of the German lections with them. Uh, also TVU, Digera, you name it. Uh, so, you know, getting a solid signal, you know, out of the field is, you know, critical part, obviously, and, you know, uh, the first mile, if you want, opposed to the last mile, it's critical. So I'll just jump on that bandwagon as well. So, you know, you, you're sort of, you know, moving into talking about kind of reliability, redundancy, that kind of thing, just, just keeping everything connected and up and running. Um, you know, Ben, this is, this is something that we, we talked about a little bit, you know, in our kind of pre-panel conversation. Um, you know, how, how do you how do you kind of even out the, the degree of risk that's elevated by producing remotely the more complicated signal flow? Um, you know, is, is that even possible? You can't get rid of all problems, but you could spend money to eliminate problems for the most part. I will never tell anyone, even with LiveView, which I would trust with almost my life. Um, you know, LiveView can still run out of battery um, or, you know, someone could take down Verizon and AT&T at the same time. Um, but I just try to level expectations with clients that I work with that, you know, th this is probably not going to happen. It could happen. And I try to have a backup situation. I mean, if you look what they did for like the, uh, the NFL draft is they had two devices at everyone's house. They had one that was running um, some sort of bot cellular, one that was just running off of, I think, plain old Zoom or something like that. Um, having those backup situations is important. Um, but if you can spend the money for extra reliability, you know, I work on TriCaster. It's a PC. PCs can crash. It rarely does anymore. But, you know, if I'm doing a absolutely must be perfect production, I'm, I would have a second one on site or, you know, extra, extra ways to do all the transmission and everything. 
Yeah, backups, backups, backups. And up, anybody that's in production that, that is getting paid for it, I'll put that away, that is getting paid for it and their livelihood depends on it, should be planning on having a backup. That's primary. It just should be done. And yeah. I think along with that, some people, uh, they don't want to take a risk. So we'll do pre-records. They don't want to, you know, they don't want their live show or um, a part of that live show to go down. So um, those clients would prefer to do a pre-record. So we'll pre-record and, you know, go back to what we talked about before about editing. You know, we'll, we'll pre-record it, edit it, flush it out. And either one part can be pre-recorded or the entire show may be pre-recorded. But to the, to the viewers, you know, to them, it, it looks live. Yeah, just case in point, um, for the NHL's last season, we put Blackbird technology both in the field and in the new New York headquarters. So you have redundancy both places. Um, you know, it wasn't technically necessary, but uh, it worked in this uh, for them to provide that redundancy. So. This kind of uh, like backup goes way back. If you look at the moon landing in the 60s, like when they recorded that on Earth before they sent it out to people, they wanted to make sure they had that transmission. So when they faked the moon landing, they had that pre-recorded and then they restreamed it out live. <laughs> yeah, what is live? Down. What is DOD? <laughs> Whatever, you know. <laughs> we could get into a very existential question. <laughs> this is Ben Ratner. He'll be here all week, folks, all week. <laughs> Tip your waiter. It's the word for Neil deGrasse Tyson who will murder me. All right, so so this is our last question before we uh, move over to, to audience Q and A. We have a lot of questions from the audience, um, so I'm looking forward to getting to those. But um, so just kind of kind of wrapping things up here, um, you know, as we hopefully approach a time where traditional workflows are you know regularly coming back online, um, you know, in person events start looking more hopefully more likely more like they did pre-COVID. Um, hopefully that's coming soon. Um, and when you can have more crew on site, you can work primarily with on-site talent. Um, you know, what what are what will be the kind of ongoing benefits of hybrid Remy decentralized workflows? Um, you know, what, what will be the benefits, you know, if any, of having developed and streamlined these approaches? Uh, Marty, let's, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I really... You know, it's fine. I think had you asked all of us this question two months ago, um, we would have a, a different answer for you then versus now. Um, you know, things have really taken a couple of steps backwards. Um, you know, we've had a lot of events get canceled over the last couple of weeks, uh, and we've had just as many inquiries into new job, uh, into people wanting to add live streaming and, and hybrid um, to their events. So I, I, I think this answer is going to continue to change. Um, I think. I think live streaming is here to stay. I think that people are going to want to add live streaming to their events to reach larger audiences. Um, for the convenience of people that just don't want to travel out to in-person events, for the executives that don't want to travel, for the, um, for the presenters and the VIPs that don't want to travel. Um, I think live streaming is here to stay. I think we've definitely learned a lot on our end. I think I've learned more about live streaming in the last year and a half than I have in my, um, in, in my, in my entire career. Um, you know, to say just one thing um, of what I uh, that I would carry over, um, I, mean, I, I think it's hard. I, I think that we've just learned so much overall, and um, you know, we've invested a lot in live streaming, and I, I think that's it's going to pay off. I, I think this is here to stay, and I think that this technology and people will be preferring this for a long time. Yeah, I agree with that. And the like, you know, there's practical reasons like redundancies you can have when you're doing a remote workflow, you know, you can send th signal out to multiple control rooms and have multiple people working on your your pieces, you can do remote monitoring because I think it will it, we never may get to the point where executives want to come on site again. <laughs> um, and I, the other thing that we noticed, you know, a couple months into the pandemic is that talent high level talent was much more willing to participate and do appearances um, when they didn't have to leave their home, right? The names that these organizations can bring in now because they say, oh, we'll send you a Zoom link and you'll come on the, you know, you'll come on the webcast um, has changed a lot. And I think talent, uh, on-camera talent will be a lot slower to appear if they have to leave their home and get a babysitter, do all the normal things we all used to do all the time. 
Yeah, those are great points. I didn't even think about that, but exec monitoring, talent, star power, um, access to talent uh, anywhere, anytime. You know, uh, I think this was sort of mentioned at some point, but basically you can get the best producers, the best directors, the best, you know, everyone because, you know, they're accessible, uh, provided they have a, you know, internet connection. Obviously cost savings, not only of moving people, but big files around. Uh, flexibility was brought about, brought up. You know, scale up, scale down. Jo you know, Jeff was mentioning this. You know, that is a big, big advantage. The ability to just be more productive uh, because you can do more um, at the drop of sort of hat, uh, hat, and with everybody watching more video, that's critically important. And then, lastly. Um, this is a particular personal sort of thing about empowering the creator economy. So, you know, as these tools to do live and video editing become more accessible to everyone, you know, you get more people producing uh, more good content and that's really powerful. And uh, uh, I'm actually going to live a bit of a van life and start practicing what I preach and uh, start um, producing videos uh, from the middle of nowhere. So. Uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. You can uh, judge that. So, I agree with Daniel. What he was saying is exactly what I was going to uh, iterate. Also, is the amount of A level talent that you can bring into the mix when you're working in distributed workflows is just key to us. Um, when we started this. The main reason I I wanted to go remote four or five years ago was. A little bit at first, as it seemed to be, it was save money on travel. That's that's the first thing. And everybody thinks that's the real reason. But as it turned out to be, is we were having, we, we have a very grueling tournament uh, schedule. We were doing 40 to 50 tournaments a year. The tournaments are 10 days long is for setup time and, you know, production and everything. Uh, these are tennis, professional tennis tournaments. So 50 a year, that's almost, yeah, you, you know how many weeks there are here. That's a lot of work, even though a lot of those are stacked on top of each other and all. But still, it was a lot of work throughout the year and a lot of travel. And so it was really hard to maintain crew through that. So when we started down the remote side of production, it was to give our crew members a, an ability to still work and still be employed because we have a lot of salary members also that are uh, that are part of it. But it's to give them the ability to have a, a higher quality of life. And so they don't have to spend all their time in a hotel room or they don't have to worry about traveling. And, and this was before we actually had to really worry about traveling. It was like, what am I going to catch? Or it, what is that ho hotel room going to be clean or not? Um, these are real things that, that are affected us in the last year. But for the most part of us, it was about giving that that the remote people that we have, whether they be freelancers or full timers, both giving them a higher quality of life was was key to to our move to remote production. Yeah, just as a as a tech person, I I would rather spend you know five hundred thousand dollars on the most beautiful, perfect control room, and then send just my cameras and people on site if they have to. But having that home base where just you know everything's going to work pretty much all the time. You could maintenance, you can deal with everything. Um, I, I like that option. So I think the Remy production model and you know that home base may be a cloud studio that you also build up really nicely um, or cloud editing, any of that stuff. But having having a solid home base and just sending the few parts that you need, um, I think is a really nice kind of compromise in production. Great, all right. So let's, uh, let's, let's get to this. Uh the stack of uh, questions we have here from the audience. And, and uh, you know, please, if you do have more questions, uh, keep keep sending them our way. Hopefully we can get to all of them. Um, so uh, yeah, this first question comes from, from Ralph and uh, Ralph Matos, and he asks, uh, can the panel elaborate on the process of cellular bonding and provide recommendations on devices based on prior experiences? So I'm using uh, the Teradek Go for bonding um, for live streaming. Now, that we're only using that when we're like, either if we're here in our studio or for out on location for sending our, our feed, our program feed, you know, to uh, out. 
We're not using it on job sites to either send camera feeds back to us again, or we're not, and we're not sending it out to a presenter or a client to get their signals back to us. Um, we're just using uh, we're using the Teradek Go for to live to, to bond together four cellular signals to live stream the program feed out to the viewers. As I mentioned before, we're using LiveView pretty extensively. So in the sports side, we're we're sending out the four unit, the, so the LU eight hundred. Those four signals come back, and in just broad overview of how cellular bonded works is you're using multiple carriers. So you might be using T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, what used to be Sprint, and those modems are in the box. Those modems break up the signal, the video signal that you're sending out, or in the case of the LU800, multiple signals going out. They send it up through either a cloud server to put it back together or a local server. And we have both in our uh, facilities. So we can either bring the sources directly into our cloud workflow or we can bring it into our MCRs back in Texas. Those servers put the signal back together. If you don't have both ends, then in there, they call it different things in the different platforms. LiveView has their own name for it. Um, the uh, TVU has their own name for it. The, uh, the guys like uh, Marty's using, they have their own name for it. Sputnik, is that right? Uh, is that still the same thing? Uh, but those are the pieces that you have to have in place. You can't just say, and a lot of people misunderstand this and try to use like Speedify or, or just a couple modems in a broadband uh, router that that has the ability to use WAN uh, modems or, or LTE modems in a router. That doesn't work as well as it may work a little bit, but usually you're only using one path. So you're not actually getting the benefit of bonded cellular, meaning multiple channels. Uh, for us, we do send out at times our simpler units, our LU 600s or 300s, that's a single channel, and we'll send that out in a talent kit. So, and that's a really powerful thing. Uh, we had to do that for some celebrity things that we did. And when you're having an A-list celebrity going, okay, so FaceTime in with you, and like, so what do I plug in? I'm like, okay, plug in the camera cable there. It's color coded. And then press the own button. And then it just shows up in our MCR. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. They didn't have to run a cable through their room and try to find the router or do any of that. We weren't de deployed, uh, didn't have to depend on Wi-Fi uh, that you know everybody thinks is in the internet. But that was one of the things that we found with the LUs. It was just so simple just to send the box out, turn, and all they had to do was turn it on. Then we take over control and we had remote control of the camera at that point too. So it's it's been a very big game changer for us. And one more note on how it works. If you're an editor, um, an analogy I like to use is that it's kind of like using a RAID system where it's going to distribute, you know, in a RAID system, you're taking one file and it's going to not only one hard drive, but the other hard drive as well in case the first hard drive dies. It's kind of doing that to split the cellular signal as well. So you can pull out one of the cell phone cards during a production and you won't even see a blip in the final, you know, in the final output. Don't do that. It's a bad idea, but you could. Yeah. Uh, we like to use Castle Case. Um, they have two cell and four cell units that we use, um, and they'll usually come, you know, two Verizon, two AT and T cards, um, and you can kind of switch them based on what's going on in your location. But for us, it's you can drop internet, you know, um, just straight like you can build a Wi-Fi network off of a Castle Case if you want to, or have them plug their Zoom laptop in if they're not getting you know, internet in their home, whatever it is that they kind of have going on. Um, so for us, it's a, like a Swiss army knife and a problem solver in that way that if you give it to your trouble talent or your talent that's planning on going live from a cornfield in Iowa, um, you can usually pull it off um, with whatever tools they have on hand and a Castle Case. So, so another question, uh, uh, this one actually is directed specifically at, at uh, Marty, although others might want to chime in. Um, so have you, Marty, have you used mobile hotspots to augment internet services for schools and families that could not connect? And if so, what devices and providers offer the most reliable service? Um, so I think, I mean, at least in our case, that um, almost goes back to the last question. Um, for the Teradek Go, we're using a Verizon wireless hotspot as as our as our uh, as our Wi-Fi connection. Uh, we're typically not sending out hotspots to um, 
to schools, to clients, whatever. I think all that really depends a lot on, you know, where where are where are they? Um, are they in the dead zone? You know, is it inside? Is it outside? So we're not sending kids to people uh, like hotspots. So really, um, unfortunately, don't have much to add on um, to that question. We're not doing that. Yeah, I mean, for us, that's what the Castle case serves as, right? It creates that network there on site. And for us, we do identify our problem talent that will be joining our problem locations and sending, you know, a Castle case there. Like, you know, New York Fashion Week's coming up and we'll probably send a Castle case to every location because when you're doing a bunch of venues like that, you just don't know what you're going to get with. And with a city like New York that's on the older side, you know, you don't always know what you're going to get. <laughs> All right, so uh, another question. Um, are there any good streaming media remote uh, certifications that you know of? I always suggest people start, if you're working in our world, um, what are your Dante audio qualifications? Uh, that's where, that's the first one, because they're free. And then after that, um, I, I like personally, I'm NCSE certified through New Tech and, and uh, VizRT. So I went through all the classes and went through all the, uh, the tests there. Uh, that was probably one of the stronger certifications in the area. Um, but there's, I don't know of just something just you could just pick up and go. There are some SMPTE classes and stuff, but you have to be a member to make that really beneficial. The, I can tell you the, the certifications I wish I had and the knowledge I wish I had was all around IT infrastructure. I know I am so reliant on the IT teams that I work with. Um, everything is network, everything. I mean, even video nowadays, uh, NDI, all this stuff, Dante, it's all over just network cables. And in the cloud, it's it's all cloudy magic. I don't know that stuff. Uh, other people know that better. Yeah, um, I, but yeah, that's constantly my struggle. And I need people like everyone on this panel to do the work for me. Well, no, I agree with Ben. IT, um, you know, whenever I, I, I'm doing a site survey and I'm meeting with IT and they're, uh, I know enough to get in trouble. I know enough to like talk a good game, but uh, I only get so far and they're like over here and I'm like, I just need the internet, man. So uh, yeah, I, I think, I think you know, um, learning more about, you know, IT infrastructure would, would be great. So, um, it's an interesting question. Um, can, this is from Alex Davies. Thanks, Alex. Um, can the panelists kind of talk through what what percentage of their remote cloud production is live? I think he means delivered live. All of ours? Live sports? Yep. I knew Jeff's answer. We, we do both uh, fi file live file ingest and live, uh, I would sort of hazard to guess, uh, probably 60% is uh, pure live. Well, actually, this, let's call it 50-50. So, you know, um, you know, what ends up uh, coming into us and made av available for sort of editing. There's, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of files floating around there with a lot of people in addition to a lot of lives. So, and just, you know, on that point, I mean, the way the industry has sort of grown up, you know, live has been separate from VOD and, you know, ten, historically technology has gone about sort of solving them as separate problems. <laughs> the reality is, is that in the future, they're going to be, you have to do both well in order to be, uh, you know, really good. And, uh, you know, even though Jeff is taking in 100% live, if the finished product isn't a combination of live uh, and VOD, you know, you're not going to have a, you know, the, the optimal sort of um, end consumer product, I would sort of argue. So, you know, at some point, all those things need to sort of come together. Hopefully that'll be sometime very soon. Just for the record, I totally agree with Daniel and I do have somebody else handling the VOD stuff. So I don't have to worry about it. So that's a beautiful thing in my particular world. Um, and matter of fact, we're using Blackbird a lot. I know they are using that the backside. So yeah, I, you still have to have a whole workflow, but uh, I prefer just to do it live. Once and done, you're over with. 
I'd have to say that our workflow is probably about 50 50 um, uh, between you know all live and 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 uh, pre-recorded we're probably looking at about half and half yeah I think for us it, it changes based on the time of year uh, maybe uh, it's probably 90 percent um, you know we have a lot of regular live content that we do and then we do special projects I'm pretty much always prepared for them to at the day of the show to be like, can we just pre-tape this segment? <laughs> um, like, you know, I feel like that request comes up every uh, conference that we do. Somebody decides that they're now too nervous to do it live. Um, but we're probably at like 90% maybe. Yeah, we're, we're mostly um, either, we're, we're live for like one 15 minute show a day. We used to do a lot more live to tape, but we've realized that with the, you know, with the lack of timeliness of our content, we just pushed a whole lot to, to just full on edit because it's just better for, for, the, for the applications that we're using it for. And so we, we have a question here from, uh, from our own uh, contributing editor, Anthony Baropas, who's actually done a lot of teaching about remote production at, at our events. Um, so he, he just asked a very specific question. Um, does anyone have experience with PepLink and their bonding service? And what what have those experiences been like? Yeah, we, we actually deploy PepLinks quite a bit. And uh, their bonding service is not exactly best for video bonding. Uh, I still lean towards our, our live views, but we do use their bonding service to give us backup internet, uh, for instance, in our trucks. Um, and that is flawless. Uh, it works really, really well for that part, but I'm not a hundred percent sure they're telling me that it's going all the right directions, but I'm just not sure those bits and bytes are going the right way without actually something putting it together on the other end. So, uh, it is definitely good gear. Uh, yeah, we'll use it as well, um, it, but in the same way, it's it's for providing internet. It's not necessarily for video transmission, right? We'll use SRT um, and a Makito or Rivet, something like that. All right, well, I'm going to throw it back to Eric here, but uh, I want to just thank everyone on the panel. This has been a lot of fun for me. Um, and it's been good. Um, Eric, back to you. Yeah, that was great. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, Steve, as we're planning Streaming Media West, please remind me that we need a session called Cloudy Magic. And uh, we'll make sure to get that on the program for people who want to learn more about Cloudy Magic. Uh, again, thanks for joining us, all the, all the panelists uh, and all the attendees. We had some great questions. And uh, we do have an Amazon gift card to give away. And the winner is Tucker Snedeker. So Tucker, you'll be getting an email in the next couple of days uh, letting you know how to get that gift card. Uh, join us again in about 30 minutes when we'll be talking about scaling your workflow uh, to grow with your audience. And uh, I'd like to thank again Blackbird for sponsoring this session. And thank you to Limelight Networks for sponsoring all of Streaming Media Connect. We'll see you in a half hour. <laughs>